Hi guys. How many of you don't want to be here tonight? Just kidding. Don't really don't answer that question. Um, okay, I want to tell you before we start about music. I want to tell you a little bit about the power of sound. And I learned a couple of things recently that w was so fascinating to me. And I thought you guys might be interested in this too. So if you think about the development of the body, the ear has a head start over the eye, right? Um, up until like the mid 90s, it was sort of hypothesized that there were, that infants could hear sounds in the womb. And, um, you know, I remember wondering, like when we had our kids, I would talk to them and wondering, what do they really hear? Well, this lady named Sheila Wood Woodward, who um, is a scientist at the University of Cape Town, became pregnant and she had the same thought. So she developed um, this technology with the Institute of Marine Technology, this tiny little microphone that uh, was waterproof that they could go in and put inside the mom right around the neck. I know this sounds totally weird, but put right by the neck of the, the baby and they could actually hear what it sounds like in there. So, you know, there, people had thought, well, they, they're, they hear frequencies like high or low frequencies which is true, but what they found out was not only do they hear frequencies, but they can hear music. They hear music in the womb, and it's discernible, like Bach. You can tell what's going on. Or like a low frequency, they can discern whether it's a man or a woman. And so think how cool that is, that while you're in the womb, you're already being kind of baptized into to music or sound, right? Because even when there's, let's say there's not music around you, think about what the body is doing. The body has this natural rhythm, right? It's like blood that pumps through the heart. So they've got this kind of rhythm that's already going. And so you are born with an awareness of sound, of rhythm, of music, whether you even know it or not. And I think that's really cool. So they're using some of this technology to, with, um, related to sound with music to treat different people like stroke patients can learn how to speak again through music. They're using that with them. Also with Alzheimer's patients. So I wanted to tell you real quick about Miss Winnie. Winnie Gibbs is, she's 86, 87 years old. She has Alzheimer's. Once upon a time, she was the Dean of Women at ACU and she was a firecracker. Like she would let you have it and just this, awesome lady. Well, as she got Alzheimer's and kind of lost who she was, it was a really sad thing. But she still could sing. And um, her son sings with us some, and um, I asked him to sing with us one Sunday, and he brought his mom, and she sat next to me, and I was like, wow, she had perfect pitch. And for those of you who don't sing, if you're a woman, the older you get, the harder it becomes to just control all that stuff in your voice. She's 85 at the, at the time and, like, was just crystal clear. So do you remember the Gibbs? You know, Stephen, Rebecca? Yeah. So anyway, so Winnie, here's Winnie. Can't say your name, you know, doesn't know who you are. We sit down and we start singing Great Is Thy Faithfulness. And all of a sudden, she begins to sing. This, whatever was inside her DNA that had developed over the years and she had had an experience with began to come out in her, even though her brain has kind of, you know, turned on her. There's something about that that just brought it back around. And she remembered through music this part of herself. I just think that's absolutely phenomenal. So, um... I'll pass it on to you. I have some more to say, but um, keep me on track here. You're good. How did Zoe come about? Uh, okay, well, and way before any of you were born, in 1995, this man in Nashville approached me about starting, um, thank you that you were born in 1995. I see you right there, you too. Uh, this guy approached me wanting to start a record label and um, we talked for a long time about it, and we both were believers, and we began to 
share kind of our interest in worship stuff. And this whole thing changed from being what was once meant to be like a secular deal to a year long of every Saturday morning, this group that we kind of chose met together to pray and to study. We studied for a year about worship and what is worship and what does the Bible say about worship and what were our own experiences that we'd had with worship. And by the end of the year, we came to this um, conclusion that um, that worship is this living thing and that God wants to, to wrap us up in this communication with Him. And so we felt a, a real calling to start a ministry for worship renewal. And back in that time, you know, there weren't a lot of contemporary songs being sung in churches. In fact, um, most churches were only singing hymns, and I love hymns. Like, some of the hymns are my fa- still my favorite songs. But um, the elders at our, our church had ch- kind of challenged us to um, develop a vocabulary of some of the newer worship music back then. So we, this is right around the time that Passion, if you're familiar with Passion or the One Day conferences, they, those got started around that time too. And we modeled some of what we did around some of our Passion friends in that we, we wanted to start um, a worship conference in Nashville that would have a CD associated with it. And we, had, we really had no clue eventually where this would go. But um, so we invited people to a worship conference and they would leave with a CD and a folio of music, which just means like a book of the sheet music so they could take it back to their church and teach these songs. And, um, and it just sort of took off from there. And that was, our first conference was 1997. So we're coming up on 20 years here in a little bit. This might be too tough a question. All right. Well, I'm a tough, but not fair. All right. Your favorite song and why? Oh, gosh. Man, that changes all the time. I don't. Are any of you singers or musicians in here? I, I find it hard to answer that question because I, I'm always, I always have a new favorite song. But um, my wife sings. She is not with us this weekend, unfortunately. But usually my favorite songs are the ones that she sings. Um, and they're songs that, that get to me. I would say hymn, as far as hymns, my favorite hymn is Oh Love That Will Not Let Me Go. That's my all-time favorite hymn. Um, my favorite kind of worship song is probably How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Um, my newest favorite is the Hill Songs um, Forever. We sing Hallelujah. I love that song. Most of you guys were in chapel this morning. Showed a little clip from a previous Acts event, which was Ben Rector talking about the place of discipline in the creative process. We were talking about it real quickly. What do you find to be the most difficult part of? You know, you guys are putting out music, you're arranging music. What, you know, and people see the final product and are grateful. I'm thankful. You know, Zoe plays in my car. I told you guys I can't sing, but that doesn't mean I can't appreciate it and can't love hearing my kids sing who can sing. Thankfully, they got their mother's DNA in that regard and not mine. But all of that to say, we see the final product and are blessed by the final product. What's the challenge? What are some of the challenges that you face from an idea to the maybe the discipline yeah. you have to have? So uh, probably the biggest challenge is you know we're all we're all musicians and we have we have our own likes and stuff but i think one of the th- things that's been really cool and frustrating at times is that because of the nature of this ministry we have to keep the church in mind so there might be songs that we want to do or we want to do a certain way and sometimes we do it anyway but kind of the point is to make make a song accessible for the church so, um, so that's the question we have to keep coming back to is, you know, is this singable? Is, will, can a church sing this? And, um, and we, we constantly keep that in front of us. So sometimes we, you know, that limits creativity a little bit for us. But um, our, the, another challenge is just trying to, to find the song. Not only the, does it work, does this arrangement work for a church, but does the song translate to a cappella? Because there are just some songs that don't that don't translate, you know, and we've tried it. We've, there are several that we've tried that we never should have tried. And I, li- I listen to him and go, wow, that, that was bad. <laughs> but, um, 
but that's another one of our challenges. And then um, we are kind of spread out now. At one point, we were all in Nashville, and now the, still the majority are in Nashville. We have a guy in San Diego, Cheryl and I are in Abilene, and then another guy in Dallas. So um, we found that when we were doing dates, you know, we were flying there anyway. So now it's not that much different. We're we're still flying wherever we're going. We're just coming from different places, and we get to have a bigger reunion. But those are some of our big challenges. That, and also, I one other thing. I don't know if this means anything to you guys, but kind of the um, uh, where is where is the where's the whole praise and worship world going? That's a question that I have right now in churches. Like, what what is the next thing? In churches, because we're kind of, you know, we're we're riding about a twenty-year wave here, and if you look at over the course of history, there's usually a pendulum swing, and something else happens and and moves. And I'm kind of asking that question right now. You know, what what is the best thing? What is healthy for the church? What do we need to? How can we help best? I guess is the best way to say that. Our previous presentation was on story, and I'm going to ask you for a possible story in asking what's a really powerful way you have seen God at work, either personally, and it might be something related to family or ministry in Abilene, or you've seen God really at work uh, with Zoe. But what, what, where have you, in the story of life, seen mm. God most evident? Okay, I'll try to answer that. Um, I, I have seen so much through Zoe. It's humbling, really, because this is the kind of thing that you, you know, we get together in the studio, we put our thing together, and then you, that's it. You know, it's out there. And for good, for better or worse, it's out there. And so the good thing is we don't know what God is doing with it because it's not ours to do with, to do anything with. It's the Lord's. He's making things happen. So we get tons of really amazing stories from literally all over the world about people who are blessed with music. I'll tell you, um, I was in worship ministry. When we lived in Nashville, I did kind of worship ministry and music um, business stuff at the same time. And then I left worship, church work and went and worked for um, in the entertainment industry for five years just doing that. And there, I had a... I had an experience in that time that I've never had before, may not ever have again. Um, the Lord literally called us back into church work after we had we had kind of said we will we don't ever want to work for a church again, um, just because it's hard working for a church sometimes. And um, God was speaking to just in, in impressions and you know as we were reading individually, my wife and I, and both of us were afraid to say something to the other one because we were afraid it might actually be real. And um, then I went, I had this, I was on this trip and was reading my Bible on the airplane, which sounds super spiritual, and I usually don't do that. But for some reason, I had my Bible and I was reading it, and I was reading out of Isaiah. And uh, Isaiah 35 talks about it's all about renewal and how the lame will leap like a deer and, um, you know, the, the crocus will come out of the ground and where there was once desert, there will be waters and all this stuff. And it, something happened to me. I don't really know how God works, but I just began to cry on the airplane. And I really thought they might kick me off or think that I'm having a nervous breakdown. But in that moment, God was, it was as if God was reading those words to me, just like depositing them in my heart. And I'd never had that kind of an experience. So I'm skipping way ahead, but that was the beginning of us opening the door to going back into church work. Skip way ahead. We ended up in Abilene, Texas. And, you know, people are like, why are you in Abilene, Texas? And um, we just knew that that's where God wanted us. Well, several weeks into us coming there, the elders, we, the staff go to elders meetings, and the elders were talking about their new vision, which was restore, their vision is restore Highland, restore Abilene, restore the world. And the guy who was kind of the ch chairman of the elders got up and said, let me call you guys back to 
the scripture that led us into this whole discussion about vision, and it was Isaiah 35. And I, I just had the, this moment of, wow, that was, because up until then, I had thought, this is so cool. God, you've done this just for us. You have, you've given, you've w- wakened us up to this um, possibility in you, and you've moved us to Abilene for, for what? You know, to Abilene for who knows what. But, in, but that night, I realized it wasn't just for us. It was that we were a part of this much larger story that God was doing. And that opened, it just really deepened my faith so much to think that how God can be so intentional in weaving all of our stories together to form something that we don't even know. But maybe a year from now, you'll look back and see, wow, that was all a part of what's coming down the road. So it was a pretty neat thing for me. All right, last question because of time, and we chat all night, but there's kind of you know, a crowd of people that would <laughs> like you to do your thing. So what's something when you were in the seat of most of the folks in this room, you're in the, that college space, what's something you wish somebody would have told you then that okay. have helped you to yeah. where you are today? Uh, okay, one thing that I think it would be that if some if somebody's going to do something, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. It's easy to be afraid of what's out there, especially right after you graduate, because there's that weird like zombie time where you've just left all your friends in college, and you know you don't actually get a month off for Christmas. And who ever thought of that? Why don't we have that? And um, but but the the real secret is. Everybody feels that way a little bit, and it doesn't matter how old they are, but if there's something out there to go after, it might as well be you. And that's the thing, instead of thinking, eh, I'm, not, I'm not good enough to do that. Well, there are a million other people who might be feeling that same way, but are going to go after it, and it might happen for one of them. So have just take a chance. You have this short window of time in your life where chances are good. And you should, if, you, if you're falling on your face, that's okay. Because later down the road, as you get married and you start having kids and whatever, you, you feel a little more boxed in. But now is your time. When you get out of here, go do something. Really, don't let anything um, hold you back. Whatever your wildest dream is, go try it. Do it. And who knows, you might be the one who actually said, hey, I'm going to try that and did it. So that's my advice.